We've been in a series on the life of David, and we've been looking at common challenges, and today we get to the end of David's life, and the most common challenge for every person, and that is his death. It's something we're all going to face at some point, and uh, what surprises us is how unprepared David is for this moment. In fact, everyone around him seems to be, except for a new person who's introduced into the story. We're going to look at three scenes that this person shows up in, and surprisingly enough, she never says a word and yet teaches us the most important lessons about being prepared for the most uninevitable th or most inevitable thing. And so this morning we're going to start in 1 Kings, the first chapter, and it says, when King David was very old, he could not keep warm, uh, even when they put covers over him. So his attendant said to him, now I'll, I'll grant it, this is a strange passage of scripture, and, and you just have to know, if you're going to look at the Bible, you have to look at all of the Bible, even the stuff that asks uh, questions of us. Uh, Let us look for a young virgin to serve the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord the king may keep warm. Then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful young woman and found Abishag, a Shumanite, and brought her to the king. The woman was very beautiful, and she took care of the king and waited on him, but the king had no sexual relations with her. Second scene. So Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room, where Abishag the Shumanite was attending him. Bathsheba bowed down, prostrating herself before the king. What is it you want? The king asked. She said to him, My lord, you yourself swore to me that your servant, uh, you yourself swore to me your servant, by the Lord your God, Solomon your son will be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my lord the king, do not know about it. Now Adonijah the son of Haggith went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. This is the third scene. Uh, Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and Bathsheba asked him, do you come peacefully? And he answered, yes, peacefully. And then he added, I have something to say to you. You may say it, she replied. As you know, he said, the kingdom was mine. All Israel looked to me as king. But things changed. And the kingdom has gone to my brother, for it has come to him from the Lord. Now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. Uh, you may make it, she said. So he continued, please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you. To give me Abishag the Shumanite as my wife. It's a strange series of passages of scripture. Um, and we're talking about a topic that, honestly, none of us are comfortable with, but I've made kind of an interesting observation in life, and that is that people who fear conversations about death really struggle to live life. That if we don't learn some um, approaches to this topic and to have conversations in the face of it, there's a lot of things that wind up being left undone in our life, and uh, we need to be equipped for it. So the story about David's death actually begins in a way that seems strange to us. Uh, David is 70 years old at this point. He's uh, aged. He's, his circulation is poor. He can't keep warm. And so strategy A, just keep putting covers on top of him. Now, I don't know if they ran out of covers or if they thought the weight of them would actually limit his ability to breathe, but they just couldn't keep him warm. So they came up with plan B. And I don't know if this plan B was some kind of superstition or if it was a practice in the region or what this reason was, but their decision was is that they would find a very beautiful virgin and that she would go and she would lie with David. And the purpose, first purpose is to warm him up, but they're also hoping that she kind of revives him. And their intention is that this would be a sexual union. So they searched the whole region for a beautiful woman and, uh, and, and they brought her, her name is Abishag, and they brought her uh, to uh, care for the king. And they thought that if David had this beautiful woman in bed with him, it might revive him. And he would feel better. Um, that somehow, if he had a new sexual partner, life would be more meaningful for him. Uh, by the way, you would be surprised how many people still think that way that somehow that is what is going to revive meaning and purpose and joy in life. So they brought in Abishag. She was very beautiful. The scripture actually indicates to us that she never had sex with David. What else is interesting is that we don't have a single word 
recorded in scripture of anything that she said. And uh, it, you, our first assumption is that she's an unimportant character in the stories. But each of these three scenes teaches us a very powerful lesson, and it's actually, sh she's the one who gets it right. Everybody else is struggling. And uh, if we actually fail to learn these very important lessons, then when the moment comes where we have to process the death of someone else or even face our own, we'll wind up distancing ourselves and maybe even abandoning people at the very time we need them the most. So here's the three scene challenges I'd like us to think about. And the first is, death is not just a problem to be solved. Death is not just a problem to be solved. The goal of one of the servants, or of the servants, is to get David off of his deathbed. They're uncomfortable with him looking weak and tired and being cold all the time. This is not the king that they remember, and they want him to be his old self. And so they decide to bring him this beautiful woman. The covers and the woman seem to fail. They're not accomplishing what they designed to do. Death is a problem they keep trying to solve. And the more you see death as a problem, the more likely you are to see the person who is dying as a problem. And that becomes an issue in and of itself. When we focus on the problem, we miss the person. And in our world, there are lots of things to try and many things to do. But in all of our trying to solve the problems, we actually miss opportunities for conversations that matter a lot. Times when your heart could have been open to each other. An opportunity for someone to confess something that they wish they had done differently. An opportunity to shed and see tears and wipe them from each other's eyes. An opportunity to honor something that they've done. And if we are always busy trying to fix the problem of death, we don't have any opportunity for that. I'm the oldest of five children, and the middle sister actually passed away a few years ago. And we knew that that was going to happen, and it was heartbreaking. And I can tell you that I had an opportunity to see her before she passed, and when I walked into the room, I believed it would be my last opportunity to talk to her. And what I can tell you is, as I, I didn't want to go, and I didn't know what to say, but one of the most powerful memories in my life is that conversation, and one of the most important conversations I've ever had. And I'm grateful that I didn't follow my instinct to avoid it, that I actually embraced it. We're, we're uncomfortable. Our culture is uncomfortable in the presence of death. And our technology provides us wonderful ways to distract ourselves from it. And everybody in the story seems to be pulled into that distraction, except for this woman, Abishag. She's not trying to fix anything. She's not trying to solve anything. She has no cure. She just is present with David. Death is not just a problem to be solved. The, the second scene gives us another lesson, and that is that death is not just an opportunity to be seized. Death is not just an opportunity to be seized. Now, last week we learned about the death of David's oldest son. His name was Absalom. Uh, this story is about his next oldest son, which is Adonijah. And Adonijah is next in line to be king if the order of succession follows what is considered a generally accepted protocol. This is how uh, family members of kings, even if you look at Great Britain, they have a succession. If they know who the next king is supposed to be. Uh, the problem is, uh, is that David is taking too long to die. And Adonijah is becoming increasingly impatient. Because as long as David is king, Adonijah can't be king. And finally, Adonijah runs out of patience. And so he... Uh, puts together this great coronation party, and he invites anybody who is anybody to this party, with the exception of a couple people. He left out the prophet. He didn't want Nathan there. And he left out Bathsheba, and he left out Solomon, two people he considered rivals to his claim on the throne. 
and, uh, and he orders a, just an incredible celebration, and there's great feasting, and it all culminates finally with this moment at the end of the celebration where people declare him to be king, and long live King Adonijah, and, and, and everybody rejoices and applauds, and everybody's happy about it. And uh, the, the challenge is, is that David still lives. But Adonijah is acting as though his father has already passed. Because David is a limitation to his life. If he were gone, I could do more. I could have more. I could be more. And I can tell you, there's a lot of that in our culture. You should know that other people are going to limit your life. Let's just check. How many parents do we have in the room? They're not just deductions. They're limitations. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Have you ever, maybe, maybe my wife and I are the only ones that have ever had a thought like this, but I wonder how many extravagant vacations we could have had. <laughs> what beautiful place could we have gone? We, we don't know. We're, we're afraid to think about it too long. Children are limitations. Your spouse is a limitation. Your parents are a limitation. And what you should know is that's what being a responsible human being is. It is. If we can't honor those limitations, then all that is left is to treat those individuals in, as, in our lives as tools to get what we really want because we don't want them. The temptation is that if we have less people, we will have more life. And it's not true. Believe it or not, limits actually add to our life and add meaning to our life. We're surprised by this because our culture doesn't tell us this. It tells us quite the opposite. Limits add to our lives. For example, I'm not a poet and I'm not a fan of reading poetry. It's not that I'm opposed to it. I just, I try and I don't seem to understand it very well. But how many have heard of a form of poetry called a sonnet? And a sonnet is limited to 14 lines. That's the limit. If you're going to write a sonnet, you don't write a 13 or 15 line sonnet. It has to be 14 lines. And yet it's astonishing how much creativity and beauty and unbelievable imagination goes into those 14 lines and has been true for uh, generations. Or how about artists? It seems as though that the, the boundary of the canvas actually limit what they can paint, and yet they have produced some of the most astonishing masterpieces that people, even hundreds of years later, will travel thousands of miles just to see for a few minutes. Or how about musicians who are limited by the score, the, the music that's on the page, and yet they play it and we see their brilliance and their mastery even by those limitations. And composers that have to honor the limits of how many beats in a measure or what key that you're in because they realize that those things don't actually stifle the, their creativity. They, they actually enhance, they release that kind of freedom and creativity. And so we have to keep this in mind. So treating David as though he's already dead actually hastens the death of Adonijah. Uh, David turned around and announced his successor, We'll talk about that story in just a moment. It was going to be Solomon. And when he did, everybody saw Adonijah for who he really was. He was an opportunist who made a claim to the throne that wasn't his to take. And he didn't look so good in that moment. And this is oddly enough where Abishag shows up again. Uh, Adonijah, once he realizes that he's not going to be the king, goes to Solomon, who is the king, goes to his mother, Bathsheba. We've heard about her in previous stories in David's life. And he goes to her and asks her for a favor. And he acknowledges that he is not the king that Solomon is and that God has given him the throne. So he, he, he's saying all the right things, but he says, I, I want you to go to Solomon and ask a favor. I know he won't refuse you. You're his mother. And so the favor is, I would like to have Abishag as my wife. Now, what's fascinating is there's nothing in Scripture that indicates there's any relationship at all here. 
There's been no expression of love, no evidence of devotion. In fact, he doesn't want Abishag because he loves her. He wants Abishag because she's a political connection to the previous king. And if he has her, he can undermine the authority of Solomon and his claim to the throne. And he can make strong political connections. And Bathsheba does it. She goes and asks Solomon, and as soon as Solomon hears it, he knows exactly what's going on, and he ordered the execution of his half-brother. And that's how Adonijah died. So death is not just an opportunity to be seized. I've seen this as a pastor. I've been in rooms where when someone is dying, family members start vying for what they can get. And when you do that, you can't be present with the person who's dying. It's just not possible. Uh, third, uh, death is not just a responsibility to be carried out. Death is not just a responsibility to be carried out. David had made a promise, and he had made it to Bathsheba that the next king would be their son, Solomon. And Bathsheba is a very responsible person. She wants to make sure that the promise of the king is carried out. Now, Bathsheba and David were unaware of what was going on, and they didn't realize that Adonijah had organized his own coronation and had himself declared as king. And uh, Nathan the prophet found out about it, and he came and told Bathsheba and said, you need to go see the king, which means she isn't seeing the king. She's not in the room with the king. And the Bible tells us this fascinating thing. When Bathsheba goes in to address this issue with King David, Abishag is there caring for David. Abishag is the one who's with the dying king. Bathsheba is not. Abishag is there because the king is dying. Bathsheba is not there because the king is dying. Bathsheba did not go to see David to see David. Bathsheba went to see David to address an issue that needed to be taken care of. As it turns out, David had not done a great job putting the final touches on his succession plan. He hadn't signed any legal documents. He hadn't made anything public. There were just a few people who were aware of his plan. And so when they come in and they tell David what's going on at, uh, about Adonijah, David actually kind of rallies a little bit. He, he goes back into king mode. He's actually paying attention to what's going on, and he wants to do what is right and make things right. And so he acts like a king again, and he orders a ceremony for Solomon in which he's acknowledged to be king, and he gets to, to sit on the throne of David. And, and he charges Solomon with some remar remarkable responsibilities. And, and you can read about that in 1 Kings, the second chapter. It, it's a fascinating fact. There's an incredible work of music that, uh, called The Last Words of David uh, that are taken from that. But they're not the only last words of David in that song. He also said some, some things that weren't just preparing Solomon for his reign. They were a little bit petty, too. You know, Some people think that the Bible was put together by men so that they can maintain control and make them look good. There's almost no men in the Bible that look good. If that was their goal, they screwed it up royally. Uh, it's just not, and, and David's not at his best right here. But if Bathsheba had not called David to action, there would have been this incredible mess that would have had to have been worked through and cleaned up. And this is not the scene we wish there was for the last conversation of David and Bathsheba. What we wish is that they would be able to share their heart with each other, declare their love for each other, honor each other, shed and wipe each other's tears, and express how much they mean to each other. And it doesn't happen. And it rarely does. We blow by those moments because there's just stuff that needs to be done. Responsibilities that need to be taken care of. The stories of Scripture don't always end with, and they live happily ever after. Because the Bible deals with real people, and it deals with real life. So we're kind of left hanging here. There's only one person who seems to be present. It doesn't get caught up in everything else. And we're wondering, 
Do we have a better example? Do we have someone who can help us face this in our lives? And the answer is yes. There's another David. There's a descendant of David. His name is Jesus. And, and we're told in Scripture that he knew he was about to die. He was not surprised by the crucifixion. He foreknew all that was going to happen to him. And he goes to Jerusalem anyway. He knows what's going to happen when he gets there. And he goes anyway. And as he's entering Jerusalem, there's this incredible celebration, which he engages in, even though he knows he's going to die. And when people try to shut the celebration down, he tells them they can't do that. Let people celebrate. This is the right time for this. And he engages in some of the most astonishing conversations with those who are closest to him on the days heading into his death. And he knows he's going to die. He expresses the deepest longings of his heart. He speaks hope and faith into their lives. He even has painful confrontations to deal with things that he knows are going to limit and restrict the potential of an individual. And he does all of this stuff. He does all of this stuff knowing he's going to die. The inevitability of Jesus' death didn't keep him from living. And it doesn't have to keep us from living either. So here's the truth I want you to walk away from this morning. I know you're, you're probably sitting here today going, good Lord, I came last week and they talked about suffering. I came this week and they talked about death. I'm afraid to come back next Sunday. What's he going to talk about on Christmas, you know? <laughs> so you don't have to wait until you die to experience resurrection. You don't have to wait until you die to experience the power of resurrection. There's this great passage in Scripture. It's Romans 8th chapter. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This is not just saying you will only live again after you've died. It's saying there's a way to access life while you live. That there's power to do things that we need to do that we don't seem to be able to do on our own. See, I wish I could tell you that if you, walk, if you showed up in rooms like this and you owned a Bible and you said a few prayers, that you could miss out on most of the difficult things in life. And in my experience, that is simply not true. There are these long, dark nights in which we carry grief and heavy burdens and sorrows, and it seems like it will not end, and we don't know what the solution is. And there's a sense of confusion. And here's what I want you to know. If you keep looking to God in those long nights, and you keep speaking to God in those long nights, eventually the light does dawn in your life again. Eventually joy is restored, and peace inhabits your heart and your mind. It does happen again. Joy does come in the morning. It does. This is also what we discover, is that even though we have not been able to see what God is doing or hear what God is saying, when we come into those moments where the light begins to dawn again, we discover for ourselves that God was never absent. That's how resurrection works. It works in secret. It works behind the scenes. God does some of his very best work in secret, and God will do some of his very best work in you. That we can learn from a woman whose name is all we know about her, and we can learn from the risen Son of God, and receive because of what he did, there's resurrection power that's available to us to help us do the things we would rather avoid. So I'm just going to give, I don't do this a lot, I'm just going to give three parting words of advice to you this morning before we close this down. When you see good things in other people's lives, acknowledge them. You'd be, you would be surprised how often people feel invisible because when they get something right, or they own their responsibility, and, and you just come up and, and you acknowledge that. You say, I saw you did that, and I'm grateful. Uh, thank you for being present. Thank you for being strong. Thank you for handling that. That's very powerful language. Uh, second thing, does, does anybody else get frustrated in life besides me? 
You know, we all have our pet peeves. One of my pet peeves is a person who feels like, even though they're not a duly deputized police officer in the state of New York, they get into the left lane to control the speed of all of us who would rather go just a little bit faster than that. <laughs> and uh, am I the only one who, you know, in my view, the speed limit is the slowest you're allowed to go, but I guess I'm wrong about that. <laughs> I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again. So, and our world is filled full of so many things that are frustrating to us. And in those moments, we've been trained by our culture and given an incredible vocabulary to be able to put people down. All the sitcoms on TV have a single thing in common. The biggest laughs come from the biggest disrespectful moments. And we're trained for this. And wouldn't it be better to be able, instead of putting people down, to call them up? We're not ignoring the situation. Maybe there's just a better way to handle it. And I think there's something to that. And maybe we could work on that a little bit. And then just lastly, this thing. You can never remind somebody too much of how much you love them. I've never heard anyone complain. They just told me too much that they love me. And those words are powerful. They're simple. So simple. And our hearts crave them. And when we say them, it matters. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, thank you for uh, giving us information that deals with the hard things in life. Because... Uh, we're not able to avoid them in this world. But we can access your wisdom and we can receive your strength and your power. And we all know this morning it's not our temperament, it's not our maturity, it's, it's, it's not our ability that, that gives us the right to resurrection power that, that helps us to be present in hard moments, to not treat people as problems to not just try to take advantage of opportunities, to, to not just focus on responsibilities, but to actually be present. Would you help us with that today? Without your power and without your grace, we're not good at this. But we are not without your power and we are not without your grace because of what your son did for us. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.